So today, yeah, I'm going to talk about sugar. Um, and the reason I've, I've titled it bittersweet is because, you know, as lovely and sweet as sugar is, there are some, you know, harmful effects um, when we consume it, especially when we consume it in large amounts. So I'll go through a little bit about sugar and what we mean by added sugars. And then I'll talk a little bit about the health effects. Um, but first, I'll just go through a little bit about my background, just so you know where I'm coming from. So as David said, um, you know, being interested in science from a very early age, it was interesting that he mentioned geology because geology was my kind of first love when it came to science. My dad is a miner. He used to bring home cores. Um, we used to look for fossils in them. So that was kind of where my science journey began. Um, but I suppose as I got older, I got quite interested in biology and I went to do biochemistry in UCD. Um, and when I went on to, you know, uh, learning about biochemistry, it's so heavily kind of um, invested in the biological processes, you know, that go on in our bodies from day to day. And nutrition is a really integral part of that. So I went on to do a PhD in nutrition, looking at how certain nutrients can affect the immune system. Um, so as Jackie said, I moved to New Zealand and it was while I was in New Zealand that I really became interested in sugar. Um, so it was within the context of early life, but the reason sugar was um, of interest was because New Zealanders consume a lot of sugar. Um, so it's a really big health problem over there. So it's something that we incorporated into our research and something that I've carried through over the last decade or so. <clears throat> so I guess to start off, what do we mean by added sugars? Um, so we don't, we know that fruit and, and things like that have, and yogurts and milk, and milk products, all have sugar in them. And if we look at our, at our food labels, as you know, Claude mentioned, you know, some of the things that, that are listed are the, the sugars in it. Um, you know, and in milk products, they have a lot of, of the sugar uh, lactose, um, but that's not an added sugar. So by added sugar, we mean anything that's added during the production process. Um, or, you know, if you're adding spoons of sugar to your tea, or you're using honey or syrup on your breakfast cereal, or even concentrated fruit juice. So while fruit itself isn't considered added sugar, it's the, the fruit, the, the sugar is kind of in the fruit itself. I mean, if you distill that down into a concentrated form, we consider that an, an, an added sugar. And I guess when we think of added sugars, we think of, you know, all the, you know, the trappings of a Western diet, you know, our, our you know, cola drinks, our, our donuts, our, our sweets and our biscuits. But sugar is actually found, or added sugars are actually found in, quite a wide range of products. And I suppose when I began my sugar journey, um, I was a bit shocked myself to learn that, you know, some of the products that have quite a considerable amount of added sugar. And we're talking about things like salad dressings, you know, things that we nearly consider consider as, as a healthy, a healthy option, you know, salad dressings, um, sauces, so like pasta sauces or any kind of tomato based sauce, um, fruit juices, um, sports drinks, all this kind of stuff, and granola bars are, are, a bit, are a big culprit as well. They all contain quite um, a considerable amount of added sugar. And it's these kind of hidden sugars, I suppose, that, that people might not be as aware of as, you know, the typical ones, you know, in our, our sweets and our biscuits and things like that. And I suppose food companies have become very, very good at um, <clears throat> not hiding the sugar, but kind of, I suppose, you know, being a little bit disingenuous, not just disingenuous, but I suppose hiding the fact the sugars in things. There's a there's a whole range of different uh, names for sugar. You know, they're, they're all essentially the same thing. They're all sugar at the end of the day. Um, but I mean, this is just a, a, um, a small example of the things that sugar is called. And some of them, I suppose, you, you nearly mistake for being a health food product, you know, things like beet sugar or rice sugar. You know, beets are healthy, rice is healthy, but you know, it's essentially the sugar that's derived from these things. And at the end of the day, it is sugar. Um, and it's the same kind of idea and the same health effects as what you would get from your spoon of sugar in your tea. So I suppose if you are thinking of cutting out sugar and, and you know, reducing sugar in your diet, understanding the way that sugar is labeled is, is really critical to, to actually being able to cut it out. Um, because often terms like this, like, like corn syrup, solids, or you know, different types of, of names have been attributed to sugar. So it might not be immediately obvious that it is sugar that, um, that's in the product. <clears throat> so I suppose the next thing to look at is, is how much do Irish people consume and is that a problem? So I found this when I was doing my search and I quite enjoyed it because, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I consumed the odd fizzy drink myself. I don't know if I'd agree fully with the, the God tier things. I think Club Lemon should definitely be in there, but um, 
yeah, that you know, Irish people love their fizzy drinks. You know, they're you know they're very pervasive in 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 Irish food consumption. Um, and when you actually break it down and look at the OECD rankings of countries that consume sugary drinks, Ireland actually features second in that list. <clears throat> Excuse me, and only second to the United States. So we are really high consumers of these types of fizzy drinks. <clears throat> so, you know, and that's not even considering the other sources of added sugar that we have, um, you know. And I suppose when we're talking about sugar, we have to consider the fact that I suppose our culture has changed quite considerably over the last maybe 20 years or so. You know, the Celtic Tiger kind of brought around, you know, a bit of a, an upsurge in, in things like cafe culture. And, um, you know, whereas, you know, you know, that might not have been the case before. And when you're going out for your cup, cup of coffee, you know, there's often quite a nice range of, of delicious pastries and and uh, and things like that um, on offer as well. And, you know, a lot of us would, you know, grab our coffee and maybe grab a scone or, you know, a, a muffin or something as well at the same time. So, you know, it this kind of change in culture has contributed quite considerably to our, I suppose, our increased sugar intakes over the last um, several decades. Um, so that's something to consider as well when we're talking about sugar consumption in Ireland and I suppose Europe in general. Um, so I suppose it's important to know what the actual recommendations are and the, the WHO have been quite clear um, about their recommendations in terms of added, the, the, this is added sugar consumption as well. And um, so their added sugar, sugar uh, recommendations stand as five to 10 teaspoons for an adult, no more than five teaspoons a day for a child. And quite recently, they've changed the guidelines for under trees, and now they recommend zero added sugars for under trees. Um, and the rule of thumb generally is that you shouldn't consume any more than 10% of your caloric intake from an added sugar. <clears throat> so it's very straightforward. And I suppose the next thing to look at is, do we kind of abide by that? Is that something that's, that's um, you know, that's, I suppose that Irish people actually kind of, uh, abide by. Um, and no is definitely the answer to that. Um, so for an adult in Ireland, the average consumption of added sugar is 25 uh, teaspoons. For children, it's about 15. And for the under trees, it's um, five to 10. So we certainly do have quite considerably high intakes of sugar in this country. <clears throat> and the reason for that really is um, because there's so much sugar in, in our diet, like, you know, everything has sugar in it, as I, as I mentioned before. And if we look at what, what five or 10 spoons of sugar actually looks like in real life, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of shocking, really. Like, you know, a can of Coke has 10 spoonfuls of sugar. So you drink a can of Coke and that's your added sugar intake for the day. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it's quite, there's quite a lot of sugar in a lot of products that you might not necessarily expect. So things like, products that have say 0% sugar or 0% fat claims, they often have sugar. I mean, you know, the things that make food tasty are generally sugar and fat. So if it's missing one, it's probably got the other in it. And um, so 0% fat products often have quite a high sugar content. And if it's not sugar content, it's usually artificial sweetener content. And um, things like pasta sauces are, are big culprits for, um, for um, high kind of sugar content. Um, and obviously breakfast cereals to a certain extent. I mean, I suppose it's not shocking that Frosties would have four teaspoons per bowl, per bowl but you know, um, I suppose that's another contributor is breakfast cereals tend to have quite a high amount of sugar in them. Um, and, you know, drinks, um, sports drinks and things like that also are very high culprits. And I suppose the thing that I, I suppose it's a bit of a bugbear of mine um, is the amount of sugar in children's food. Um, I know in, in New Zealand, um, the um, Plunkett or the, the agency that kind of um, administers early life visits are sponsored by Washies, which is a food, a food company. And they would often recommend some of these pouches that, that are available for, for children who are weaning. But they're so high in sugar, like a lot of them, you know, any of the ones that have fruit in them basically are going to have seriously high sugar content. Um, like you can see here from, from the table here that like some of them have up to eight teaspoons of sugar, which is, you know, well above what should, what a, what a child should have. And especially when you're considering that the under trees are the kind of prime target for these, um, for these kind of foodstuffs. So um, it is quite a big problem um, in terms of childhood uh, sugar intakes. So I hope this kind of illustrates that like, you know, while we're, we're, we're recommended to only take five or 10 spoonfuls of sugar it's actually it's so pervasive 
in our food chain, but it's really difficult to actually adhere to that. And most people don't even realize that they're, they're intaking such a high amount of sugar. Um, so that kind of brings me to the like more biological side of things, like what does sugar actually do to your body? Um, so there are claims floating around that sugar is addictive. Um, these are, you know, based in some reality. So it's never been definitively shown um, in humans. There are certain criteria um, that you need to meet to, um, to, I suppose, fulfill the addiction criteria. Um, and I suppose it's not been definitively shown in a scientific study that is the case, but it has been shown in rodents. So studies in mice and rats have shown that it's, it's, it, it, it activates the areas of the brain that are involved in, um, in, in reward and addiction. Um, so I'm not going to go too in-depth into it. Um, neurobiology is not my, my particular area and it can get quite complex quite quick. Um, so I shy away from it. Um, but essentially, sugar activates what's called the dopamine, do, dopamine pathways. Um, so dopamine is just a protein in your brain um, that, that sparks off when you, um, when you intake something. And it, it's basically in response to things like reward or motivation, so pleasure, um, you know, compulsion and, and things like that. So, you know, it's the area of the brain that would be, um, that would be sparked off um, in terms of, say, cocaine addiction and things like that. So sugar does activate that area of the brain. Um, so in that way, you know, it can be classed as potentially addictive. So there are some indications that sugar has addictive properties. So that's something to consider when you're, when you're giving up sugar, I suppose. Um, but I suppose there's this kind of uh, cycle, you know, in terms of, of sugar kind of consumption. And basically what happens is, you know, you eat your sugar, tastes nice, um, activates those area, areas of your brain. Um, then what you get is um, an increase in insulin, um, which um, clears the, the which, so you get a spike in, in blood glucose, um, which activates in, in a protein called insulin. Um, this clears the, the blood sugar from your body. Then you have a dip in sugar. So this is what we call the sugar crash. So you have this drop in blood sugar levels, um, and then you start to kind of um, get a bit tired and low. Um, you start getting hunger and cravings um, because your blood sugar is low. This then increases your appetite and your cravings. And then you, you say, I love another bar of chocolate and off you go again. And, and it's the continuous cycle. Um, so from this perspective, um, sugar definitely has effects in the brain and can be classed as a potentially addictive substance. Um, although that has not definitively been shown, I guess. <clears throat> But there's multiple effects throughout the body in relation to sugar. Um, I suppose the big ones are on our metabolic health. So um, organs like the liver. Um, so when the liver receives too much, um, too much sugar in, in a short space of time, what it does is it actually converts that to fat. Um, and that can contribute to conditions such as fatty liver disease, um, which kind of can go on to have serious consequences for your liver health. Um, and your overall metabolic health. And it's one of the factors that can contribute to type 2 diabetes. And when we're talking about type 2 diabetes, you know, the pancreas is an organ that's really important for that. So it's the, the organ that actually secretes insulin. And when we're getting these big spikes in insulin after eating sugar, it puts a lot of pressure on the pancreas. And over time, that can build and build, and that can cause um, serious effects on the pancreas, which can lead to, to type 2 diabetes. Um, you know, I've mentioned the brain already. There's some, <clears throat> you know, there's addictive properties in terms of sugar. And um, the kidneys is another organ that could be affected where, you know, too much blood sugar can then spill into the urine and that can cause quite considerable damage to your kidneys. You know, there's also effects on, on you know, your fertility in terms of high sugar levels um, and even your skin. So sugar actually has quite a considerable amount of negative effects on the body. Um, so certainly limiting your sugar intake is essential for kind of maintaining a healthy, a healthy body. Um, and just because it's my area and I'm quite interested in it, I'll just touch very, very lightly on um, sugar and early life. Um, so there's quite a considerable amount of evidence now, and some of that's from work that we've done ourselves. Um, and it shows that if you consume a large amount of either sugar or even artificial sweeteners during pregnancy, that can have a range of effects, not only in the mother, where you see um, you know, an increase in the likelihood of developing pregnancy complications, such as gestational diabetes or increased weight gain. Um, you can also have effects on the grown baby. Um, and this essentially amounts to 
um, kind of an increase in BMI in the child as, as he or she grows. Um, so there, there's association to that. And there's also some associations with, um, with preterm birth and um, sugar consumption as well. So there are some quite negative effects kind of during the pregnancy stage if there's a lot of sugar consumed during pregnancy. And even if you're exposed early in life, and this can be while breastfeeding, so um, fructose goes through the breast milk um, and can be you know, delivered to the baby by that way, or even just early life sugar consumption, um, kind of you know, anywhere from toddlerhood up to, to kind of adolescence, um, can have a range of, of different effects on the body. Um, and I'm not going to go into some of these, like so the, the gut um, microbiota, so they're all, they're all the bacteria that live in your gut and they're essential for for health and um, keeping your body healthy, um, they can be affected. Um, your appetite can be affected and your taste preference can be affected if you've been ex exposed to sugar um, early in life. And all these lead to an increase in the likelihood that you become obese um, later in life. So there are some quite negative consequences in terms of sugar consumption in the early life period. Um, so cutting out sugar in, in, in that category is, is really important for maintaining, I suppose, a healthy population in general, um, you know, we're seeing increased childhood obesity. So, you know, one of the ways that we could potentially um, act to, you know, cut that back is, is um, making sure people reduce their sugar intake early in life. <clears throat> and I suppose um, when you think of sugar, something that's kind of, I suppose, come a very kind of popular topic over the last maybe decade or so is sugar taxes. And Ireland introduced sugar tax in 2018. Um, so, there's kind of limited evidence for sugar tax being effective. And the reason for that is because really they're not around long enough that we can kind of gain enough reliable data over a long period of time to judge whether or not they've been effective. And um, specifically in terms of health claims, health claims, you know, you need to kind of look at it maybe a five or 10 year period. We don't have enough information right now in terms of population um, kind of uh, uh, the kind of association between population obesity reduction and sugar taxes, but hopefully over the next decade or so, we'll get that kind of information coming through. Um, so in Ireland, um, they've they've introduced a sugar tax. Um, so it's generated over 30 million in revenue in the first year. Um, so that's good for the exchequer, exchequer, I suppose. And you would hope that the government are funneling that money into obesity prevention measures and things like that. Um, but yeah. Um, so last year it was actually down 2 million in, in revenue and whether that's, you know, people being a bit more conscientious in terms of their, their diet during, uh, during COVID or I don't know, but it, it certainly is a good sign that people are reducing their intakes of these sugary drinks. Um, but just to highlight it again, it's not just sugary drinks. Sugary drinks account for about a third of the added sugars that we, that we get in our diet. So there's another two thirds out there that you know, possibly are not being affected. Um, and just to highlight, we're not the only country um, that have introduced sugar tax. They've become more and more popular throughout the world. And there's, there's you know, a considerable amount of countries now who have implemented them. And I've just kind of cherry picked three. So Mexico was one of the first that kind of brought this in. And um, they had a really promising start where they saw, I think it was a 6% inc or decrease in, in, sugar, in sugar drink sales in the first year. Um, so it, it started off quite well, but it's bounced back a bit now. It's still, it's still less than it had been, and the sugar in just sugar drink industry seems to have slowed down a wee bit. Um, but it's certainly not kind of maintaining the trajectory that it had um, kind of at the outset. So from that point of view, I suppose it's a bit mixed. We don't know whether or not it's, it's having the effect, the desired effect yet. Um, the French one seems to be having an impact. Um, again, it, it was introduced recently, so time will tell whether or not it's effective. But I suppose the one that kind of uh, springs to mind is the first place in the States that introduced sugar tax was the city of Berkeley in California. And within the first year, they saw a 40% drop in sales. And along with that, they saw increase in 60, 60, 63% um, in water consumption um, by the, the kind of city water rates um, in low uh, socioeconomic groups. So kind of the poor neighborhoods seem to be drinking more water, which indicates that maybe they're drinking water because they're not drinking the busy drinks. So there are some there are some signs that the sugar taxes are having a benefit, but I suppose we can't definitively say that for another, you know, another while, while you know, while data is generated in terms of, you know, obesity rates and their association with the sugar taxes. And um, it'll be a little bit of time before we can actually make a, a true judgment on, on whether or not they're effective in terms of tackling obesity and things like that. And there are factors that we do have to consider with the sugar tax, you know, 
people may not be drinking their sugar, their sugary beverages. They might be going for an artificial sweetener, um, beverage, like a diet beverage instead. Um, they might be getting their sugar elsewhere, um, or they might be going for a cheaper alternative, you know, you know, that might have been the same cost as their original kind of choice. Um, and another thing that I suppose is is I suppose a bit worrying is a lot of the, the, the drinks companies then absorb the cost of the tax so that there's not a massive increase in the amount that the consumer actually pays. So there are some factors that can kind of I suppose are causing a bit of kind of you know which kind of negate the, the positive effects of the sugar taxes. Um, but it's kind of one of those kind of wait and see and, and hopefully hopefully it will have an effect. Um, so in a talk about sugar, I suppose it would be remiss of me not to just very briefly touch on artificial sweeteners. Because um, they are, the, I suppose, one of the main alternatives to sugary kind of beverages. Um, there, are, uh, there are numerous artificial sweeteners out there. <clears throat> Um, I suppose the most popular ones, certainly in terms of, of Irish consumption, are sulfame K, which I suppose a lot of people haven't heard of, and aspartame. People are probably probably a bit more familiar for people like. Um, and then there's a, a, a range of other ones from saccharin, sucralose, and some of the newer ones like neotame. They're, they're essentially, you know, anywhere from 100 to, you know, 20,000 times the, the sweetness of normal sugar. So, you know, you can add a very small amount of these and they'll still have this massively potent sweetness effect. Um, so they act in a number of ways. They, you know, they obviously don't have calories, but they still initiate that, you know, sweet taste. So basically they have, they, when you consume them, they activate, um, they activate proteins in your tongue and that sends a loop to your brain to tell your brain that you're receiving sweetness. Um, but they also act on numerous different organs. So they act in the gush, they act in your pancreas. There's a whole range of effects that they have. Um, you know, and they're, they're thought to impact a wide range of organs in a similar way to, um, to normal sugar. Um, actually, one thing that I thought was quite interesting, because they pass through your body relatively unchanged, um, you can measure them in, in wastewater treatment plants um, and it can get a gauge of, of how much sweeteners people are actually consuming. Um, but one side effect of this is because it's kind of pervasive in our water supply, um, it has a, a quite a negative effect on our fish population. So I thought that was quite interesting that, that, that that's kind of going on. So again, Irish people do drink a lot of, of fizzy drinks and they drink a lot of diet colas. And this has increased, you know, since the introduction of the sugar tax. Um, you know, we're, we're very high consumers of these artificial sweeteners. And again, like sugar, it's hidden in a range of different things that you probably wouldn't expect it. I mean, like a lot of toothpaste, the reason it's sweet is because it has um, sweeteners in it. Tooth, uh, chewing gums, um, Calpol, like infant medications, um, and things like um, energy, the energy drinks like Barack and things like that, they would all have sweeteners in them. Um, but they're not as innocuous as we might expect. So they have been associated with a range of negative health effects, including weight gain, type 2 diabetes, stroke and heart disease um, and things like that. So they're not necessarily the best option in terms of an alternative to sugar because they do have quite a number of significant health effects. So it's just to touch on that and just to, sh to show that, you know, sweetener or, you know, the, the sweeteners might not be the best alternative to sugar when you're when you're considering cutting sugar in your diet because they do have negative health impacts. Um, so just to finish off, I thought I'd, you know, I'm not a dietitian, so, you know, if you, if you are thinking of, of cutting out sugar and you want kind of professional help, my advice would be to, to contact a dietitian. But just from my perspective and my kind of trying to cut sugar out of my diet journey, um, I thought I'd, I'd kind of give some of my tips, I suppose. Um, and the first one is to go easy on yourself because it's really difficult. It's in so much of our food chain um, that it takes a lot of effort to, to to cut down or cut out, and it's one step at a time. You know, whether it's cutting out fizzy drinks out of your diet, or, you know, stop, you know, slowly reducing the amount of sugar you put in your tea or coffee, those kind of steps, you know, you know, any, you know, little steps can be beneficial too. So, I mean, go easy on yourself and, make, and do it one step at a time if you're not comfortable with kind of going cold, cold turkey. Um, so, as I said, Avoiding artificial sweeteners is probably a good idea um, because they're not necessarily any healthier than, than typical sugars. Um, knowledge is power. Um, knowing what the sugars are, you know, what, that there's different names for sugars and, and that there's a range of different things that they can be called in food products, as well as knowing the different sources of added sugars in, in our food chain. 
um, is really key to, to being able to cut down and cut out sugar in your diet. Um, and I suppose identifying healthy alternatives, um, um, you know, instead of having, you know, a fruit juice, maybe have an orange, you know, uh, I know that's easier said than done, um, but identifying kind of, you know, you know, recipes online, there's lots of recipes online for, you know, healthy alternatives that don't include the same level of sugar. And these are all kind of, you know, I suppose where I've come from on, in my journey of, of cutting out sugar, although I've not succeeded in that yet. So hopefully over the next few years, I'll, I'll get it down to zero. But yeah, it is it is a very hard journey to, to cut it out completely from your diet. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure um, being able to share this information with you.